Actually, we should talk about whether how town style is to say sentient or sentient. Oh man, sentient? Sentient. Sentient. According to the dictionary, the American pronunciation mm -hmm. is sentient. sentient. But interestingly, a lot of the researchers in this area are British or Australian. Sentient. Let's just go with the sentient. Yeah, we didn't win the Revolutionary War just to start saying sentient. <laughs> right. Now, octopuses, is it octopi, octopuses? Uh, crabs and lobsters can feel pain and will be recognized as uh, sentient. After the UK left the European Union, they decided they needed a new animal welfare law, and they ended up including not just vertebrates, but also any cephalopod mollusk and any decapod crustacean. Including crabs, lobsters, crayfish, prawns, and squids. So, all the ones we boil alive? <laughs> This hasn't actually led to any specific regulations in the UK yet, but it really made me wonder. How do you detect pain in animals that don't make faces and don't have voices? And if we think that some animals are sentient, but others aren't, where do we draw the line? If you're like me, you were raised on Disney and Sir David Attenborough. This is a catastrophe! And you're probably thinking, of course, animals can feel things. They're alive. But we can see why this is a debate if we look at the old family tree. So we're here with the other mammals. We share an ancestor that lived around 200 million years ago. And our line diverged from that of the reptiles and birds a bit earlier. Together, we make up the tetrapods, which left the ocean and split off from the fish lineage over 400 million years ago. And then when you get to the invertebrates, like octopus, squid, crabs, and insects, our common ancestor with them would have been a very primitive worm-like thing that lived more than half a billion years ago. So their brains and ours developed completely independently. We ended up with a neocortex, that's the wrinkly outer layer of our brains. It's an important part for our pain perception, and it's unique to mammals. Birds do have something similar, so scientists seem to agree that at least mammals and birds are sentient. But hold up, can you define sentience really quick? Yeah. So sentience is the ability to have good and bad feelings. Hmm. Or maybe, maybe it's better to say sentience is the ability to have good and bad experiences. That your ability to label the experience is what makes you sentient? It's your ability to have the experience. It, it, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm having trouble sorting out a subjective, a subjective experience. experience. When there is something it is to be like. What is conscious? So the question, okay, in humans. Pain feels like an inherent thing. But at some point on that dimmer switch, it's either off or on. <laughs> yeah, I did a bad job explaining sentience to Adam, but in my defense, Pretty much everybody does a bad job at this because it remains one of the biggest mysteries in science. So we'll just say for the purposes of this video that sentience and consciousness can be used interchangeably and they refer to a state of basic awareness. But we're talking about something more specific than just receiving sensory input. All of these living things can sense their environment and respond to threats. Some robots can too. But most people think it takes more than that for those electrical and chemical reactions to be experienced and produce feelings like pain. You don't have to be intelligent to be sentient. You just need to be aware. And we don't really know how that awareness is generated. We don't know how it's generated. We don't know what it requires. We just know it's like dark matter. It's, infer its existence mm -hmm. is inferred by the fact that we're all here like observing things and feeling things and being nervous that we came across poorly at a party and whatnot. So if, if we don't know what is generating this awareness, how can we say that some species have this and some don't? That That's the whole question of this story, Adam. I, okay, great. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, and, and if you talk to any of these researchers or these philosophers who are, who are trying to do this, they would say, we can't be sure, we can't prove it, but they still think it's worth doing. Mm -hmm. So how would you try to figure out if a crab or an octopus could feel pain? You'd probably poke it to see what it does, right? Well, in this study, researchers pinched the tip of an octopus arm right here where the arrow is. And over the next several seconds, you can see how it withdrew and kind of curled up to get away. They also tried dipping the arm in tap water, which is harmful for octopuses, and it withdrew even faster. But the key detail here is that these arms are no longer attached to an octopus. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you tricked me. Uh... Yeah, because I was imagining a sad little octopus at the end of that arm. But no, this was just 
that word that I can't remember. Nociceps. Nociception. Nociception. Right. Nociception is a warning system that detects harmful things with specialized nerve cells in our skin called nociceptors. If the stimulus is strong enough, these receptors can automatically tell the muscles to move away from the harmful thing. That's the withdrawal reflex. You've probably experienced this when you're not careful with your toaster. And as you can imagine, this is super useful for staying alive so you can find nociception across the animal kingdom. So these are escape reflexes from a crayfish, a fruit fly larva, and a simple nematode worm. In sentient animals, that nociceptive signal also travels to the parts of our brain that generate the experience of, ouch, I don't like that. So in medical research, they often just call these pain receptors. But what the severed octopus arm shows is that nociception can produce a response in the absence of any awareness or pain. And so for that reason, we think the ability to respond isn't gonna be enough. Perhaps what we're looking for is something like the flexibility of the response. Heather Browning is one of the authors on the review paper that convinced the UK to include invertebrates in their welfare law. If the goal is to distinguish reflex behaviors from a pain response, what is the best way of going about doing that? Yeah, I mean, so obviously there's difficulties because no one really agrees on whether you have control for enough things. Um, but I guess you know the kinds of things that you're looking for is perhaps new situations that the animal hasn't experienced before so that it hasn't developed sort of a simple reflex response, or just where the responses that you're seeing are flexible and relatively complex. One of the key studies cited in their review involved a very small octopus, maybe eight or 10 centimeters with its arms out. And they were placed in a special tank that had been wallpapered with spots and stripes. So first they just wanted to see which side of the tank it preferred, and this cool octopus tracking system logged the time it spent in each chamber. Then the researcher injected some of the octopuses in the arm with some acetic acid. This is basically a diluted vinegar. And she told me this might feel like getting lemon juice in a paper cut. These injections were done under sedation, but when the animal woke up, it was placed back in whichever side of the tank it initially preferred and locked on that side for 20 minutes while the acid was in the arm. Then they were taken out and allowed to rest for five or six hours, and then they repeated the preference test. But now they changed their preference and spent less time in the chamber associated with the acid injection. For comparison, they had a control group that received a saltwater injection, and those animals did not change their preference. This very carefully designed study is the first evidence for pain experience in the octopus. You know, the study has not been replicated that I know of, but these are very statistically significant differences. So basically there was some sort of, some aspect of the pain experience was being remembered, that they, they were like, I associate this striped room with that horrible paper cut I had earlier, and I don't want to be around that. So we're like pretty far from reflex at this point. What Browning's team did is they came up with eight criteria. These are sort of tests for sentience based on anatomy and behavior. And after reviewing all of the research they could find, they said octopuses meet seven criteria, and we need more research on the eighth. What we can hope to do is gather a body of evidence, so not just to give any one test or any one indicator, but you know, a body of evidence across a whole different range of things, that should raise the probability of the sentience explanation, that should make that just the better explanation for what we're observing than the skeptical explanation would be. Crabs satisfied at least five criteria based on studies showing that they can learn to avoid an area where they received an electric shock and that they will hold an injured claw close to their body and guard it with their other limb. And as a result, the report recommended that octopus crabs and their close relatives be regarded as sentient for the purposes of UK law. Okay, but here's the unsatisfying reality of it all. If you eavesdrop on the conversations between researchers in these fields, you'll find that there's no consensus on whether these are good criteria for sentience. Some have said that under this framework, a simple nematode worm could qualify for protection because they're capable of some basic learning and flexibility. And it's hard to imagine that they're sentient with just 300 neurons, although who knows? And then there are some who still want to set the bar much higher, and they claim that a neocortex is required to feel pain. The problem with that is evolution offers plenty of examples of similar functions arising in different ways. So we process our vision with our neocortex, but we know lots of invertebrates can definitely see. Sentience could be like that. And that's what we may be learning from the octopus. You know, if we are persuaded by 
the octopus. In the case for sentience in the octopus, it dismisses this claim that you need a cerebral cortex to have consciousness mm -hmm. or sentience. And, you know, I think that raises a lot of possibilities. Totally, yeah. There's this one counterexample that we know for sure, or not for sure, for but sure. there's strong evidence from this one cerebral cortex missing creature that it's experiencing pain in, in a way that, that we can kind of appreciate. Yeah. When I went to the aquarium recently, the octopus seemed uncomfortable. These crabs looked annoyed with each other. I spent a long time watching a spiny lobster just calmly clean itself. It's easy to imagine that these animals are experiencing their lives, but it's really hard to prove. And if you want to get technical about it, we can't prove that any animal or any human actually feels pain. All we can do is ask them how they feel. And it's just hard to figure out a way to pose that question to a shrimp. In the meantime, we use these animals every day in research labs and aquariums, but mostly in restaurants and kitchens. And there are only a handful of countries that regulate how the food industry treats invertebrates. Same goes for fish. In the US, it's mammals like cows and pigs that need to be stunned so that they're not awake when they're slaughtered. And that's not because science proved that pigs are sentient. They get the benefit of the doubt. And while researchers will keep trying to understand the mechanisms of sentience, the UK has taken this small step to extend that benefit of the doubt to the other side of the family tree. Hey, thank you for watching this video. If you're new here, Howtown is a channel that investigates where facts come from. It's something that Adam and I started on our own independently. And to help keep it going, we've set up a Patreon page where we're providing bonus videos and conversations for supporters of this project. This week, we'll be talking about insect sentience. So when it comes to insect pain, there has been this idea for a long time that they just don't react to injuries in the way that we would expect a sentient animal to. But I recently received a video from a researcher that is challenging this idea. And she mm. was studying bumblebees. 